teaching constitutional law at its core is an exercise in storytelling. And while the facts of the stories end up falling away in some respects, uh, the tales of the circumstances that lead us to the Supreme Court are so fascinating. And we have a chance to share them with our students and extract these important principles of power, liberty, fairness, and justice from them, right? We use these stories. People who are fighting for their freedom to practice their religion, for recognition of their marriages, um, to express their opposition to war. Um, we use these stories to frame debates about the meaning of the Constitution. And I'll also sort of tag that teaching about these principles um, is difficult, right? And it sometimes leads to particularly spicy moments in the classroom. But that's what can be so fun about it if you are prepared and willing to embrace the spice and to rein it in from time to time. So today we're going to talk about some elements of criminal procedure. Um, they represent a couple of key stages of the process. So we are going to talk about how the state obtains evidence, uh, the circumstances under which you are entitled to a lawyer, and how juries are organized. And we're going to do so with an eye to evaluating if the government is taking the right steps following this recipe, which I will reveal in a second, following this recipe uh, to constitutionally deprive you of your life or your liberty. So the first major question for us is, what are the rights of the criminally accused and why are they so important? And this is where uh, my talk diverges from Professor McGuire's. Um, so when I'm thinking about the First Amendment, for example, I'm thinking about activities that I'm engaged in that the government may not interfere with. And when I'm thinking about the criminal process amendments, I'm thinking about my fundamental right to my life and my freedom, right? We see this in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, we borrow these ideas from uh, thinkers like Locke. And I'm thinking about these amendments as giving the government and giving us a recipe to take away our life or our liberty. And the questions for us today are going to be focused on if the government is following this recipe. So, you know, some of the ingredients are maybe we can call them precise, right? We know what a half of a cup is. We know what a tablespoon is. But what happens if the instructions are vague, right? Uh, my grandmother would kill me, but I still don't know what a dash is, right? I think there's actually a measure for a dash, but I have no idea what it is. Um, and what happens if they don't follow those rules? Um, so I think that criminal procedure can be compared and contrasted to the other freedoms in the Bill of Rights in some key ways. Okay. So I think that criminal procedure, again, is similar to the substantive freedoms in that they represent these acknowledgments about how we keep the government from becoming too powerful or uh, too tyrannical. But whereas the substantive amendments restrict the government's ability to constrain our enjoyment of our natural rights, criminal procedure is going to give us this checklist of what the government needs to do to deprive us of our life or our liberty. So tonight I'm going to give the briefest of brief overviews of three areas of law in particular. Um, I'm going to talk about the admissibility of evidence in trials. I'm going to talk about jury selection practices and the provision of counsel. Um, now, the Eighth Amendment should also be in the mix here, um, and if we're going to talk about criminal procedure, I need to acknowledge it, but we're not going to talk about it today. So, uh, yeah, anyway, okay, so we see some early evidence that governments and governments that we like to borrow from, um, we see evidence that they were thinking about the rights of the criminally accused. So uh, a classic, uh, classic example here, right, is in the Magna Carta. So if you just take a minute to sit with this excerpt from the Magna Carta, sorry, I'm having mouse issues. I don't know if you hear all this rustling over here. Um, so if you see this uh, quote from the Magna Carta here, 
um, you see a couple of key elements. Um, we see uh, language of seizing or imprisoning someone, um, having rights and possessions being cast out of society. Um, none of these things can happen according to the Magna Carta unless um, there is some process, which is you know, interpreted here as judgment by peers or by the law of the land. So there is some debate in early criminal process jurisprudence about what the Magna Carta was actually saying. Um, was due process written in here as an observation of how things tended to work at the time? Or was it connected to some greater idea? In any case, um, let's just transition to one of the first opinions that I want to talk about. So in any case, uh, one of the first opinions that the Supreme Court had an opportunity to, inc um, to incorporate a criminal process amendment, um, we're looking back at this idea here that we have some sense that there are some fundamental things that the government needs to do, this recipe. But we're going to ask this question first um, pertaining to the right to a grand jury. We're going to ask if that is necessary to the recipe of taking away someone's life or their liberty. And in this first case, Hurtado versus California, the Supreme Court is going to decide that this process right to a grand jury isn't great enough. Okay. So very briefly, what we are dealing with in this case is a man named Joseph. His wife is having an affair um, and he ends up um, shooting and killing the man that his wife is having an affair with. What's key to this case is that he is brought to trial without a grand jury to indict him. Instead, what happens is the prosecutor brings an information, which is a document that a prosecutor can produce and a judge reviews it and decides to move forward with the charges or not. And he's going to object that that violates um, due process of law. So this question, right, then is, is indictment by a grand jury fundamental to this recipe? And the Supreme Court is going to say that the content of the due process rights that we see in the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendment is going to be very important, right? So if we think back to the Fourteenth Amendment and how it lays out for us this idea of due process, what the majority is going to say here, so you see Justice Matthews, um, this quote here, basically what he's saying is, if the 14th Amendment was meant to include the idea of a grand jury, it would have said grand jury. But we don't see that in the 14th Amendment. So it's clear that this is not a part of the recipe of due process. But we see, on the other hand, some indications that the justices are open to the idea of this recipe of due process um, and having it apply to the states. So here we have Justice Harlan in a dissent in Hurtado versus California. And what I really love about this dissent is that I think it's the ultimate example of citing your sources. Um, so Harlan appeals to numerous famous jurists to make his point about the importance of grand juries. Um, he's making the point that grand juries aren't beholden to the government. It makes it more likely that a defendant is going to receive an impartial hearing if they are indicted by a grand jury. Um, but we know today that if a prosecutor wanted to, she could indict a ham sandwich, but that is okay. And it is a completely different lecture topic. So Harlan thinks that this is a part of the recipe. What's important about this case is that it doesn't totally kill the idea that there are discoverable elements of the criminal process amendments that can be applied to state deprivations of life and liberty. So yet again, we see in Matthew's um, majority opinion, he is he's saying um, states can exert um, so states can exert their processes, right? They can follow their own recipes for taking away your life or your liberty. 
We don't think that grand juries are a part of that recipe, but states have to remain constrained within these boundaries of um, these fundamental principles of liberty and justice. Grand juries aren't that, but maybe something else is. So um, as a very, very brief aside, as I was looking into Hurtado um, and some of these additional facts to sort of, um, you know, round out this explanation of how it does not include the grand jury as a part of the recipe for due process, um, I went down this little rabbit hole. And you know how when you're on Google and you start typing something in and then the first thing autofills? Well, the first thing that autofills when you go and type in Hurtado is this barbecue restaurant in Arlington. So naturally, you know, I have nothing else better to do. I go down the rabbit hole and I actually reach out to Hurtado Barbecue and I try to find out the answer to this question, are you related to Joseph Hurtado? And they were kind enough to respond. They are not sure. But if I find an answer to this question, you better believe I am going to follow up with you. So, okay. Grand juries, not fundamental to taking away someone's life or their liberty. But how is the court going to deal with this idea that there might be some things that are fundamental to this recipe? Okay. So um, a key case for us in determining which processes are important for courts to adhere to in order to take away one's life or liberty comes from this case twining. So the details aren't really important. Um, the court rejects another element of the recipe here at self-incrimination, um, but it gives us a clue of how we might evaluate if something should be included in this idea of criminal process. So Justice Moody says, um, you know, it's not about those elements being present in the amendments so much as it is that those elements are fundamental to this concept of justice and of liberty. So Moody's, ooh, Moody's going to give us this hint that there might be these fundamental or inalienable um, process rights in the Bill of Rights um, but we need to discover them. And we're going to discover them on a case by case basis. Okay, so that set up means that we might need to cut off one area of law and talk about it in the document section. Okay, so we're going to see this play out in our first area of law. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, the state obtains evidence of suspected criminal activity. So I want to take a look at the Fourth Amendment here. So a major question relevant to the Fourth Amendment, which protects individuals from unreasonable searches and seizures is, if you're protected from unreasonable searches and seizures, what happens to the evidence that is obtained if a search is determined to be unreasonable? In other words, how do we enforce the Fourth Amendment if a state gets searching and seizing wrong? So the Supreme Court is going to say early on that if the Fourth Amendment has any meaning, then law enforcement should not be able to enter um, evidence that is unconstitutionally obtained, right? It should be excluded. So if you are collecting evidence in an unconstitutional way, your punishment is, is that you can't use that evidence in a criminal trial. But, but up until MAP, which is one of the major cases that I want to talk about, up until MAP, the court holds that the exclusionary rule or punishing, um, not following the recipe applies at the federal level, but it does not apply at the state level. So we see the court kind of split here in terms of which level of government has to follow the exclusionary rule. Okay. So this leads us to MAP versus Ohio. So in this case, um, the Supreme Court is going, to, um, is going to determine if the exclusionary rule is fundamental to um, the government's deprivation of your life or liberty in a constitutional way. 
Okay, so in this case, um, the Cleveland police are in search of a bombing suspect. They uh, force their way into uh, Dalry Mapp's house. They do not have a warrant. They find a gun, they find obscene materials, and um, Mapp does what any good person would do in this situation. She says, those are not my things. But she's arrested on a felony charge of possessing obscene materials. And the Supreme Court is going to ask the question, if those materials were obtained in an unconstitutional way through an unconstitutional search, can you use them against Ms. Mapp in court. Okay. So I think Clark's logic here is, is very smart, right? So Clark here is saying um, it's very silly. It's very silly that we have one standard to punish an illegal search and seizure at the federal level and a different standard at the state level, right? It's a little strange that if MAP was engaging in a federal criminal activity, um, there would be a different standard for including or excluding that evidence in her trial. Okay, so something that I might do with my students if I'm talking about the exclusionary rule is I might set up a pros and cons kind of debate, right? So what are the reasons why we might want to disincentivize police from illegally obtaining evidence? Okay, so you might go through a couple of different things. So, um, you know, an argument for the exclusionary rule might be that it deters police misconduct, right? So if you have this in place, police are going to be disincentivized from collecting evidence in illegal ways. This is the fruit of the poisonous tree um, doctrine. Um, so it's this idea that if you are seeking out this evidence, um, you, you, you have, you've tainted that evidence by obtaining it in this way. Um, but then you also have arguments on the other side here, right? Which is to say, um, you know, does this really deter police misconduct? And should we let a criminal go free because of a mistake that is either made at the warrant stage or by, by the, by the police? So there are a couple of different things you can put in the pro camp and the con camp for the exclusionary rule. And I think that they come out a bit um, in some of the cases that deal with exceptions to the exclusionary rule, which we unfortunately do not have time for because I am zooming through things. Okay, maybe, maybe after this presentation, you watch it at 0.5 speed. That might be, that might be the best speed for this. Okay. So I want to make sure that we have enough time to talk about um, these next two areas. And I'm very happy to talk about exceptions to the exclusionary rule um, in the Q&A. So, okay. So let's just say that the police have obtained evidence in a constitutional way and prosecutors are moving forward with a case against you. What should you expect the state to do to ensure that they are following this recipe? So the first thing I want to talk about is counsel, right? So how do we think about the provision of counsel as being an important step that the government has to take before they remove um, your freedom or before they take your life from you? Okay. So I'd like you just to take a millisecond <laughs> to imagine that you are in Gideon's situation. So Clarence Gideon, he robs a pool hall, he damages some property. If he is convicted of these crimes, he's going to go to prison for five years and he can't afford an attorney. Does he have a right to one? And in 1961, uh, the answer was, it wasn't so clear. Um, the right to an attorney hasn't always been guaranteed in all criminal cases, even though we see that language in the Sixth Amendment. Um, so, um, why I put up this life, liberty, or property language and the Sixth Amendment language is because I think that they play off of each other in an interesting way in terms of the progression of the right to counsel. So we see the right to counsel kind of move through these elements. So we see the right to counsel first um, sort of uh, expanded 
under this life principle. Then we see it expanded under the liberty or you know imprisonment principle, but we haven't seen it really under sort of this property principle yet. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So states are reluctant to apply a robust right to counsel on their turf. Um, and I want to look at this progression through a couple of cases. So, okay. In the access to counsel cases, again, we see this progression through this extension of access to counsel as it sort of progresses through life and liberty. So the first case that's really important to us is a case called Powell versus Alabama. And in this case, um, sort of a very brief synopsis of the facts here is that a group of black men are traveling through the South. They are away from home and they are accused of raping two white women on a train. They are hauled into court. The death penalty is on the table. They are scared. They have limited reading and writing skills. And Alabama law says, um, if you are charged with a capital crime, you are entitled to an attorney, but nobody's coming forward for them, right? And when an attorney finally does come forward, it's only a few minutes before the trial and eight of the nine men are sentenced to death. So in this moment, I think there is an opportunity to ask students, if you were in the position of these men, would you have been satisfied with the process that led to your conviction? Um, and you can critique some of the parts of this process. And it can also turn into a conversation about the ways that the process could have been improved or a conversation about what lawyers bring to the table, right? So lawyers bring um, the ability to craft legal arguments. Lawyers probably understand the law better than you. Um, they know the procedures relevant to your case. And um, I don't know if Professor McGuire is in the audience, but I was discussing his paper um, earlier this week with my class on the role that experience plays in success in the Supreme Court. So there is some strategic knowledge that comes along with being an attorney. And I think it's kind of a fun conversation to have because it establishes why a lay person is not going to be equipped to navigate the system on their own as a, as a matter of course. Okay, so the Alabama Supreme Court is going to say that having a brief consultation with a lawyer minutes before your trial is adequate. And again, this is an opportunity to talk to your students about what adequate means. Um, so I think this connects back to this idea of fairness and how we think about the due process amendments as ensuring, again, I feel like a broken record, ensuring that the government is not going to take these things away from you without following these steps. Okay, so in this case, the court stops short of extending the right to counsel in all cases, right? Remember, it's extended in um, situations where the death penalty is on the line. And we see that the court is a little bit mixed in their extension of the right if you are only, and I say only, um, going to lose your liberty or if there's a prison sentence on the line um, as a result of the crime that you have committed. Okay, so what's interesting about these two cases is that we're looking at, again, we have a counterfeiter in Johnson v. Zerbst and we have a robber in Betts versus Brady. But if the court says you're entitled to an attorney in one situation where you could go to prison, and that's if you are in a federal court and not in another situation where you are going through a state court, um, I kind of think of Betts versus Brady as a little bit of a hiccup in access to just or access to counsel jurisprudence. Um, because again, if I can walk across the street or <laughs> If I go commit a federal crime, I am entitled to an attorney, but not at the state level. So is the law somehow easier to understand at the state level? Um, what's, what's going on there? Okay, I'm not satisfied by this. So 
this gets us to Gideon versus Wainwright. So um, Gideon, right, he's allegedly breaking into a pool room. He is arrested based on a witness statement that they have seen Gideon with some change in his pocket, which is likely from a cigarette machine or a record player that he has smashed. And it's very clear that Gideon cannot afford an attorney to defend him. I mean, he's stealing coins from a cigarette machine for goodness sakes, right? He doesn't have the funds to defend himself. So he's sentenced to five years in prison and all throughout his appeals, he's arguing that because his personal liberty interests are at stake, he is guaranteed access to an attorney under the constitution, right? If you are gonna deprive me of my liberty, you have to give me this thing that the constitution says I am entitled to. Um, Florida says too bad, um, enjoy, enjoy your five years in prison. And while he is in prison, and this is one of the, um, one of the materials that I want to talk about later, while he's in prison, he writes an appeal to the Supreme Court urging them to take his case. And a future Supreme Court justice actually appears as his pro bono counsel. And they make the argument that even lawyers get lawyers because the law is so complex. So why should we expect Gideon to be able to represent himself? So the Supreme Court agrees with that argument. And I want to further underscore why attorney parity is so important. The government is hiring lawyers to prosecute people. So clearly lawyers are important to this process, right? Um, the fact that defendants who have money can hire lawyers and the fact that the government has lawyers are indicators that lawyers in criminal courts are necessities. They're not luxuries. Okay. So this kind of leads to an interesting question. So if in order to deprive me of my life or my liberty, you have to um, at least offer me counsel, why not, why not property or why not other serious things that one can lose? So the cartoon that I put up here um, is meant to poke fun at the progression of access to counsel, right? So um, the status of the right to counsel is that it has been extended to different types of crimes, different types of liberty losses, but it hasn't been extended to civil cases. So I feel like you could discuss with your students what you could lose in a civil case. So it's um, an interesting question if we think that losing children or losing a house or seeking a protective order against an abusive partner, are those things serious enough to warrant having a lawyer to help you navigate that process? Okay. So, Okay, great. I'm going to go slightly over and not be punished by Joe or Kelsey. And we're going to talk very briefly about jury selection. So, okay. We're a defendant in a criminal case. We've had a lawyer appointed to help us with our defense and we have deemed that counsel adequate. But now we're not just facing the judge. There is also this group of 12 people that is going to assess um, if I am guilty or not. And you're looking out over that group of people and you're wondering, is this a cross section of my community? Um, is this what Middletown, Connecticut or Arlington, Texas looks like? And were people intentionally um, not included in the jury selection process to lead the jury to look like this? So the final stop on this whirlwind tour is jury selection. Framers love juries, juries are everywhere. Um, we see evidence of juries in the Declaration, in the Constitution, and in a whopping three amendments. So they love them. But now the question is, as we are selecting jurors, are there ways that we limit fairness by limiting the pool of people that we might be choosing from? Jury service, okay. <laughs> So just uh, two cases to sort of tee up this part of the discussion, um, Hernandez versus Texas and Batson versus Kentucky. 
they concern different elements of the juror selection process and ask this question, if you are, um, if you are going to have an impartial trial by a jury of your peers, are your peers actually who are in contention to be selected to be a part of the jury? So what we see in Hernandez versus Texas is this really interesting overlap right between equal protection and the criminal procedure amendments, which is to say, um, in this case, the Supreme Court first extends equal protection to nationality groups, but also through that process leads to a completely different selection pool for Hernandez's, um, the rehearing of his case. He is found guilty of murder in both cases, but in the second instance, what we observe is that the juror pool is drawn in a more in a, in a more fair and a more um, so just way. In Batson, um, the concern is a little bit different. So in this case, Batson, who is black, he is indicted for burglary. White and black citizens are called for jury selection, but the prosecution eliminates um, the four black members of the jury pool and the all white jury finds Batson guilty. So the question for the Supreme Court, again, sort of layering these equal protection and criminal procedure um, elements on top of each other is, can you remove a juror from the juror pool on the basis of their race? And while you can't use the jury selection process to ensure that a jury maps perfectly onto the racial diversity of your community, um, the state cannot use this form of challenge to excuse jurors. And I think an interesting point of conversation for your students here is um, about the greater effects of discriminatory jury selection practices in a community. So Powell in the, in the majority for, um, for Batson says, quote, the harm from discriminatory jury selection extends beyond that inflicted on the defendant and the excluded juror to touch the entire community. Selection procedures that purposefully exclude Black persons from juries undermine public confidence in the fairness of our system. So I think these are pretty powerful words about the importance of following the due process recipe. The consequences of not doing so are so profound not only on the defendant, but on the community. Criminal process is evolving all the time. There is a lot of it. Each of these topics that I have breezed through, you could spend an entire semester, an entire lifetime um, engaging with. Um, and it's evolving all the time. So things that we haven't talked about, um, including the incorporation of excessive fines and fees to the states in TIMS, or uh, in 2020, uh, just incorporating the idea of a unanimous jury verdict required to convict a defendant. Um, these things are exciting and they're happening now. Um, and the major takeaway I think is that criminal procedure isn't just about what happens to those accused of crimes, but it's also about these underlying principles of fairness, which I find to be incredibly relatable to talk about with students. Thank you.